This month, if you hear an unusually loud buzz about March Madness coming from the campuses of Indiana and Purdue universities, the subject might not be basketball. Instead, the hubbub may well center on another high stakes competition that involves shots, fouls and tip offs, namely the battle over who will control what can be taught and to a certain extent merely uttered at the state's public colleges and universities. Hi, I'm John Chuanis, and on this week's show, we'll examine a multifaceted, highly charged debate that more or less boils down to this. Are left-leaning professors trying to force their beliefs on students or at least stifle debate? Or are conservative lawmakers attempting to impose their views at the expense of academic freedom? Get ready to go courtside, the court of public opinion that is, with Indiana lawmakers from the state house to your house. Tension between the Indiana General Assembly and the state's leading post-secondary institutions is nothing new. Oh sure, lawmakers have long enjoyed celebrating sports championships and over the years, they've adopted countless resolutions recognizing the achievements of students, faculty and staff. Those accolades, however, often have been overshadowed by broad-based suspicion, misunderstanding and thinly veiled animosity and on occasion that animosity has given way to full-blown acrimony. One such Donnybrook erupted in 1946 when three members of Indiana University's law school faculty signed a letter encouraging the State Board of Elections to include the Communist Party on an upcoming election ballot. A decade later, hundreds of IU students wore and distributed green feathers to protest efforts to cleanse the state's public schools of any book mentioning Robin Hood, ostensibly for fear that the characters steal from the rich to give to the poor antics promoted communism. And in the late 1960s, Purdue University's administration attributed reductions in state higher ed funding to lawmakers' dissatisfaction with students' growing opposition to racial repression, gender stereotyping, and U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Some disputes have spanned decades, as evidenced by the General Assembly's long-running battle against IU's renowned Kinsey Institute. Last year, after complaining for more than 70 years about Kinsey's exploration of human sexuality, Conservative lawmakers succeeded in shutting off all state funding for the Institute. This year, the cause of uproar is Senate Bill 202, which would require Indiana's public universities and their faculties to accommodate, quote, intellectual diversity. Supporters of the bill now awaiting action by Governor Eric Holcomb say the measure will allow conservatives to feel more comfortable on campus. Critics, including most, if not all, of the state's student groups and faculty organizations condemn the legislation as a short-sighted, heavy-handed attempt to upend academic freedom and promote intellectually tenuous beliefs. Whether SB 202 actually protects intellectual diversity is yet to be determined, but one thing is certain. This Hoosier tradition of debating what should and shouldn't take place on our college campuses is likely to continue for years, if not decades, to come. I am pleased to welcome four people who've been at the forefront of this session's most significant higher education debates. Republican Representative Bob Banning of Indianapolis, Democratic Representative Sheila Klinker of Lafayette, Republican Senator Spencer Deary of West Lafayette, and Democratic Representative Ed Delaney of Indianapolis. Thank you all for being here during what I know is crunch time, maybe missing some conference committees, but I feel like we're having a conference committee right here. You're all on some of the same uh, bills, in fact. Uh, let me start with you, Spencer Deary. You uh, authored what arguably is one of the most uh, controversial, highest profile bills this session, Senate Bill 202. Uh, what, what were you hoping to accomplish with that? What prompted it? You know, John Stuart Mill said that both teacher and learner go to sleep at their post when there's no enemy in the field. Few people can tell me with a straight face that across every department of every university in our state that students are being exposed to rigorous scholarly debate that crosses uh, ideological lines. And I believe that contributes to a low growing, um, low going university attending in rate in our state which trails the national average and is on the decline. And it's also a disservice to students of all political stripes um, when they're not challenged and exposed to, uh, to debate. And so it's in a measured attempt to try to reinforce academic freedom and tenure rights, but also to ask a little bit more to uh, change that culture. Did you see examples of this when you were at Purdue? You were not there as a student, mm -hmm. but you were there for a decade or so as Deputy Chief of Staff to then President, former Governor Mitch Daniels. Is this something that was on your radar back then? I, I think that 
few people will tell you that there's ideological diversity in any university. I think that Purdue is a, a leader in, in this area, a leader in academic um, freedom. But we can do more and we can do better. And there's also a conversation to have about too, is tenure designed in our state in a way that's working for taxpayers, working for students. Um, this bill reinforces tenure protections, elevates them to law um, from where right now their policy, but it, it does also ask them to come back every five years as is common throughout higher education. Two thirds of, state already, of states already require this and to report on what they're doing with that right. And Delaney, he mentioned uh, John Stewart Mill. Does this mean I've read John Stewart? He has Mill, to give. You have Marks. to give equal opportunity you know, so. to Rousseau, Locke, and uh, no, I think we got to give Karl Marx. equal opportunity to ourselves. Over 200 years, we came up with a system of state universities with tenure. This gentleman now wants to rescue and enforce tenure. He wants the Indiana General Assembly to decide the issue of tenure. That's a remarkable idea. That's not our job. And what he's done, in effect. He's the guy that starts a fire so that he can put it out. That's what he's doing. The fire is to say there's all this problem at these universities, so I'm going to create a solution. It's not a solution. It's a threat. And we need to think very carefully and hopefully undo this over time. Well, I want to get everybody in the discussion, but I feel that begs a response. Uh, are you starting fires just to put them out? As I said, it's, if, I think few people can say that we, don't, that we have ideological diversity. And there, you look around the country, and there are examples of tenure being um, avoided, being manipulated, and this says that's not okay. Right now, there's nothing in state code that protects tenure rights. This changes that and makes it a matter of law that you cannot ret retaliate it against for your research, for your political views, or your criticism of the administration. It's already a law. point in committee that, that you saw this actually <laughs> as advancing the cause of tenure. Wait, we, have, we have a constitution that provides that. We have academic freedom. You're protecting us from risks that we don't have, but you're creating new risks, okay? We're going to have a test. Are you into affirmative action? Is that the idea? Because you say in your article you want more conservative professors. Are we going to have a quota at IU as to how many conservatives will suit you? That's not the bill at all. Well, that's what you said in your press release here the other day. You want more conservative professors. How are you going to get there? You got a quota? I don't have any idea what you're talking about in terms of press release or, or, or but well, what I want is I want as much right ideological here. balance as I'd be happy can, to read can be in a way that respects. Yeah, this was written we yesterday. We only have 25 minutes. <laughs> yes, reading yes, excerpts may not work as well. Yeah. You look we, at we it. We fail to recruit well. and cultivate conservative scholars. So you want to get more? Or don't you? Of course, we want to have ideological diversity. Now, that doesn't mean that there has to be balance. There's no quotas. All it says is we want to be able to have faculty that come back and say, you know, here's what we're doing to promote ideological diversity. Bob Baining, what's a guy who's known for the, as the grandfather, the architect of the voucher program for K through 12, wading into this debate? Uh, obviously, it's I'm being somewhat facetious that your role is uh, long-standing role with education, but. You obviously support this. Well, first off, you'd have to understand that the Education Committee in, in the House and the Senate are actually responsible from pre-K all the way oh, to the higher ed. So um, Representative Delaney and I have um, had on the floor, uh, I think he mentioned that we seldom, if ever, get involved in higher ed. There are times where I think it's appropriate. And I felt that 202, looking at the, uh, some of the provisions, obviously the House changed um, some of the things significantly. We took out the uh, trustee language. We did tweak and I think made it a, a better bill in terms of trying to uh, soften some of we the We're talking about on. taking out trustee language. That was the provision that would have given lawmakers or leadership more opportunity to place uh, members on those uh, those boards as opposed to alumni vote. Correct. Uh, I, well, I, the Senate had sent over where they were going to change the makeup of the trustees. And while I think Representative Delaney and I have chatted about that, the, if you look at our state universities and the appointments and how they're kind of randomly, it, it really, I think, depended on when they were, uh, when we founded them, and then the, <laughs> we put in place, this is who gets this, this, gets that. We probably need a thorough review, but it didn't make sense to me to drop that in this bill, so we pulled that out. I do believe that um, Senator Deary was trying to really strike a balance, um, and to his point about tenure, I mean, it is, the state of California, I believe, is one that legislated tenure uh, and review. Um, it's in 37 states. 67% um, of colleges have some form of tenure review. 
Uh, Indiana State already had tenure review in place uh, every three years. This just puts it, puts some parameters in it. Um, we don't require, I actually um, amended the language so that um, it's not required that the Board of Trustees, but actually it, they can delegate to their peers. Which to would have be good because every five years, you, every <clears throat> member would be up who has tenure would be up and that would be almost a full-time proposition presumably. For but you really, the way the bill works though, you're actually, there's the, the Board of Trustees sets the policies and then the, their peers are the ones that are evaluating the tenure and whether or not you're would go correct. Up too. Yeah. You know, and I'm just note, making note of here on this date at this time, Bob Banning said Indiana needs to be more like California. I could go be like there. Florida or California. I don't like to be. Those, I like are, to be those are pretty distinct I choices. Like Indiana. Uh, yeah. Let's yeah. talk to somebody who spent uh, a good deal of her career in and around uh, higher education. Uh, long Thank time. You. Not only a Purdue uh, graduate, but certainly a long time well, as educator a, there. Is the system broken? Well, as a parent of three students who graduated from Purdue, I have to say that uh, I thought that their education um, was very, if I can say this, um, uh, straightforward and uh, they had many professors who happened to be Republican as well as Dem a Democrat. Dr. Phil von Fossen, who's um, a very fine professor and head of the Ackerman Center, happens to be uh, a Republican. Uh, so I, I saw uh, very bipartisan work being done at Purdue and, and didn't really see the need uh, for this situation. And I think with the three-hour discussion that we had on 202, one of the longest discussions I've ever seen on a bill, um, there were uh, fears that we were going after a university tenure and uh, <clears throat> faculty people that maybe uh, wondered why this was a problem. Uh, and why we were bringing this up at this time. Um, all the schools testified, uh, but I think uh, Purdue doesn't have this problem at all. I think uh, Meng Cheng will tell you, uh, the new uh, president of Purdue, that this is not a problem. That's Purdue. what he said in the letter to faculty when they were rather concerned about yes, the, the, uh, the absence. We saw Pam Witten, the president, his counterpart at IU, who was yes. vocal uh, in opposing the bill. Not so much from Purdue, which the, the faculty association there said, uh, I think the word was cowardly. Was that a cowardly response? Well, so. I, I think they felt like they were already doing uh, what the bill proposes, uh, that they, the faculty uh, uh, is, is very bipartisan in their approach to issues, uh, and I would say um, tend to be uh, very open-minded uh, and allow for discussion on um, both Democratic issues and Republican issues. You know, and I wonder sometimes this probably, I don't know what majors your kids were, but it does vary perhaps mm -hmm. depending on the field of uh, pursuit That's of right. degree. Yes. Uh, yep. I was journalism political science. <laughs> I had Economics. an avowed Marxist in one of my poli sci classes. I had an avowed <laughs> socialist in one of my, and here I sit today, uh, weathered <laughs> the storm. Uh, maybe not so much in my geology classes and others. Uh, but, and I know you're thinking primarily about politics and governance, mm -hmm. but what you've heard all the what-if scenarios, and, and I'd like you to address mm -hmm. them. You probably have addressed them a thousand times, and I think Ed Delaney has brought up a few of them, but what about the biology professor mm -hmm. or the medical professor that has to explain that some people, and there is scholarship on this, say that vaccines can cause, no. uh, put someone uh, in position to be on the autism spectrum, or the uh, history professor who has to say what was motivating Hitler to in the Third Reich uh, in a World War II history class. And I could certainly yeah. go on uh, climate change, uh, environmental scientists, who th those, there are scholarships suggesting it's not a serious problem. I think this is one of the biggest myths about the bill, that it either requires the teaching of something or the prohibiting of teaching of something else. The bill doesn't do that at all. All it simply says is every few years, five years, you should be able to express ways which you've promoted free inquiry, intellectual uh, diversity, and free expression. It, even the, if you the, disagree even with the, it, though, The I mean. definition is very focused on scholarly, by what that means, but that doesn't mean you have to teach anything. If you don't believe you should be teaching it, then don't teach it, and you'll be able to explain that, why it shouldn't be, be taught. It, it has no mandate that anything be taught, and it's ludicrous to claim that 
that requires that you t teach that because it's not in the bill. I must like, not, what about, I must I mean, not the sky's it. not falling, is it? What's the worst case scenario wait, that can wait, happen? Let, let's start a couple points. First of all, Purdue has behaved very badly here. The president of Purdue put out a letter with the trustees that basically says, we're already good boys and girls, <laughs> but they're not good boys and girls down in Bloomington. And we're going to impose our rules on them. That's literally the gist of what they're saying there. Okay. Now let's remember who has the nude Olympics are yeah, good for you. Yeah, yeah, but you see, you see the problem. <laughs> All right, the second, so that's very divisive and very unnecessary. We didn't need that kind of competition. Let's play basketball. Let's not play this. But the second thing is the bill, the only real requirement is that you can't be hired or given tenure if you don't show a likelihood of creating intellectual diversity. That's a test of ideology and a test of speech, okay? You can't force people to speak. There's two sides of the First Amendment. You can't restrict my speech, but you also can't force me to say something that I don't believe. And that's the core problem with this bill. So we're all supposed to come in and say, well, I'm very much into intellectual diversity. I had a leftist in my class. What is that all about? Let the professors teach what they want. And let's pretend this fake thing that the schools are losing students because there aren't enough conservatives. Go down to the business school at Bloomington and find out who's there. How many liberals are there in the ag school? Their people are different. There's a reason that there are not so many Although conservatives. Well, the former dean of the business school uh, testified against uh, the bill, I believe. Yeah, I mean, you know, so uh, I think so this not, whole... It's not, don't so we're fighting a myth, but it's dangerous to fight a myth on the field of people's free speech. Uh, where do, I mean, what is the state's obligation here? We hear a lot about discomfort for students, and, we, and in fact, there was the survey that the state commissioned, that the General Assembly commissioned, and what was it, 40-some percent, 46% uh, percent of... Re Conservatives felt comfortable and that they could express views 70 some percent and uh, of, yeah, of, said of, they could. Uh, did, does the state have an obligation to make students feel comfortable? Uh, I mean, is it and, and, and how do you reconcile that with the notion that a lot of Republicans a few years ago were talking about snowflakes and political correctness and people need to have thick skin? I mean, is there inconsistency here? I don't think that the state has an obligation. I think the state has an obligation to make sure that students have an opportunity to have the same uh, freedom of speech, diversity mm -hmm. of thought, and I think a, a quality teacher and um, Representative Klinker would probably agree with this. I don't think when you walk in a classroom, you need to challenge the student, but you should not necessarily. Your political beliefs should not be. Should not be. You That's should correct. not know whether. I mean, it, it kind of surprises sure. me when Representative Klinker says, "Well, I know this person a Republican, this person a Democrat," because I think an effective educator is going to challenge all theories of thought and not put their personal beliefs in terms of at least, and, and clearly there's gonna be some that you know, bleeds through just because of who you are, but that is not what effective teaching is. But effective teaching is pushing the edge of the envelope on both sides. And I think the way that we're talking about intellectual diversity, that's clearly where I think we all wanna have. We don't wanna have a one-sided, I, I know Representative Delaney would not want an all one-sided at all, uh, <clears throat> rights leaning ideology and I think we could all agree we don't want left so how do we figure out that we have intellectual diversity and I think that's what mm -hmm. the bill is attempting to provide as, as a teacher um, sixth, sixth grade and eighth grade uh, in English we had many people come into the classroom both Republican and Democrat were asked uh, to come into the classroom and state some of their beliefs uh, and I never thought it was a partisan situation at all. Uh, we had many teachers who were very active um, outside of the classroom in both parties, both Republican and Democrat. Um, and that's, that's the way we wanted it to be. Uh, we didn't want any certain political view. And when the students would, would ask me something uh, while I was teaching, I refused to answer that uh, because that's, that's the way it ought to be. Both sides uh, should be heard in the classroom, and we we had that to come to middle school. Well, Spencer Derry, is this a one and done? I mean, it's waiting still the governor's signature. We don't, as we tape mm -hmm. this, know exactly what the, its fate will be in that regard. Uh, but is this a mission accomplished as you see it, or, you know, I I've been talking to this gentleman sitting to your left for the past decade about, uh, for instance, I'll go back to school choice and vouchers, and it's it's been an ongoing incremental process. I think you would agree. Uh, turning it into the most extensive program of its type in the country. Is this step one or is this, are you done 
So if the question is, did, is this bill going to fix every issue and challenge we have in higher education? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> um, it's a first attempt to try to um, change some, some cultural issues that I believe will help both improve the quality of education that students receive as well as the quantity of Hoosiers who are willing to enroll. But we'll continue to fine tune each week and address other issues in higher education. And taking the culture is a core problem. How do you do that without affecting free speech? How do you change the culture of a university? When will you be done with making sure there's enough conservatives in Bloomington? I'm sorry, I think you're on a very dangerous path here. We are not Florida, we are not California, we are Indiana, we have great universities. Is there a harm that there's more liberals in Bloomington than West Lafayette? That's a problem somehow? That has, the thousands of kids who are applying the IU Thousands. They, I think they have the highest application level. People aren't afraid to go there because they're conservative. What's You're taking a card, and my friends in the Black Caucus have pointed this out. You're taking something away from the DEI movement and turning it into the conservative I movement. Let's get the conservatives in here. We need more conservatives. Where are you going with this? How many conservative professors do we need? Who's going to decide who's conservative enough? You think you're going to do that? You can't do that. But more importantly, you shouldn't do that. Well, you also brought up the, the diversity, inclusion, yes. equity, and inclusion and, issue. And you do have the group diversity. Concerned Clergy and some civil rights groups that have called on the governor to, to veto this because of their concerns about the, 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 what you've described as transparency surrounding DEI. Uh, is there a valid complaint <clears throat> that they have? No, the bill is very measured and, boosts and increases academic freedoms. It does nothing to inhibit or prohibit um, DEI. On that front, you're basically just looking for an accounting, an annual it, accounting right of, now, if you of were what's to, done and what's spent? Is if you right? were to ask universities how much they spend on diversity, equity, and inclusion, they could not answer that question because it's marbled so much throughout the university. It's hard to define, and it's a lot of money we're talking about. And so it makes sense to have an accounting and determine what is being invested. Are we getting the right ROI on it? This bill doesn't say you can't spend money on it. It just says, let's know what we're spending on it. And we should all want to know that. What are we spending on this idea? What are we going to spend to review 2,500 faculty members every five years? The IU says $3.7 million. So what's that going to cost well, the, statewide? The nonpartisan fiscal analysts didn't think it had a large They didn't know how to count there. it, did they? I think they yeah. did a great job. Of so, 2,500 people, we're going to decide what they taught, when they taught, and whether they're likely to increase the culture of diversity well, in thought. Well, but okay. in fairness, Representative Delaney, you would remember, too, uh, President Witten did institute, and when she was in Georgia, a uh, tenure review, so I'm who knows? I'm back to this. I ain't in Georgia. That's what the I problem with the Republican but, but, Party is. But I'm not in a competition with bad states. I'm not in competition either. I'm, I'm just bringing it up. I'm still surprised with point. your endorsement of California. Yeah, yeah. Georgia yeah. Seems more I use California as a reference. You'll take a bad idea from anywhere. Seven states do it. You'll take a bad idea from anywhere. They don't care. You know what? We should close out with something less controversial. Yeah. Anti-Semitism <laughs> measures. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Which is also still Which is also still pending. Yes, it is. Do we need to, you know, that... That uh, it's changed. It's yes, not what it, it was as initially drafted, and it's it's made it more palatable to some and less palatable to mm -hmm. others. What do we need to do on that uh, front? I think well, we we have, as a matter of fact, um, a review of that bill uh, today. You all are going to be heading there yes, to uh, discuss uh, that very that's thing. That's right. When we leave, feel free here. to make news here and now if you'd yes, like. Yes, we're uh, going to be discussing that, and I I think that's it's a very important bill, uh, and and we want it to certainly. Uh, include the uh, diversity and inclusion uh, in anti-Semitism, but uh, the wording, I think, has to be uh, looked at very carefully. The concern right was that with the examples that were included in the in the initial House bill, yes, uh, open the door to a ban or prohibition on criticism of the nation or government of Israel. At least that's how some interpreted it. Now, I think the mm -hmm. bill was drafted specifically to say it could be criticized as any other country would be criticized, but yep. I guess that would be decided perhaps in court. Uh, are you satisfied? Uh, you know, it, it passed essentially with no no votes. It was, what, 83 to yeah. 17. Yeah, came, twice. It came out of the, the, two the, years uh, in a row. the House and, and didn't make it through the Senate last year. Would you find the changes satisfactory? No, I think uh, I think if you go to the Jewish community and majority, we agree for once. 
I agree on numbers. <laughs> yep. You go to the Jewish community, the number, they actually are opposed to the bill as it stands right now. Yeah. Yes, and I, I think, That's you know, the intent of the bill has been totally Some subverted. aspects of the Jewish community. I mean, it's hard, Many, to, yeah, hard correct. to say. It's hard everybody. to say yeah. that everybody does. I agree with that. But That's a majority right. of the uh, people of the Jewish community have come in and they're very concerned about yeah. the direction yeah. of the And I hear you weighing in. You're right. We're yeah, I, with I, I agree with him. The, 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 the Senate court, version essentially has no content, and one of the things they left out is the statement that you can criticize Israel. They, they, took, that that, in there, really, they yeah. took that out. That was in the House version. You know, so wait, you're saying you're, I thought you just agreed with I him. I agree with he him does. completely. I, we agree we, on that. We issue. think okay. we need to pass the bill. I think we need to pass the bill as it passed the House two times in a row, two right. years in a row. You don't have concerns about free speech issues? Look, some of the examples that are used in there could be a little more precise, but on the whole, it's a very good measured approach to saying that you can criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic, and but you can't be anti-Semitic, and it helps us understand what that means. The current bill is so short from the Senate that it doesn't help anybody understand anything about anti-Semitism or what it means. Spencer Derry, final word as we wrap up. You know, I was a little disappointed in the way that it came out of the Senate, um, and particularly I was led to believe that this was a compromise that everybody was was good with before the testimony <laughs> started to happen. Um, and so I, I would have liked Anytime to... Anytime you hear everybody's good with I, I would have liked to have it gone farther, and I'm hoping that we can find that right balance as we negotiate it across the finish line. We'll work on that today. Good luck. All right. Committee. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all for taking time from conference committees to come and, and share your, your thoughts on these very important issues. Again, my guests Thank have you. been Republican Representative Bob Baining of Indianapolis, Democratic Representative Sheila Klinker of Lafayette, Republican Senator Spencer Deary of West Lafayette, and Democratic Representative Ed Delaney of Indianapolis. It's been a short but by no means quiet session. Next week, we'll do our best to make sense of it all with Indiana's legislative leaders on the next Indiana Lawmakers. Time now for my weekly conversation with Indiana Lawmakers commentator Ed Feigenbaum, publisher of Indiana Legislative Insight and its sister newsletter, Indiana Education Insight, both part of Hannah News Service. It's the crazy, it's the witching hour. What's going to happen? Oh. Just get the crystal. Here, I don't have a crystal ball. I got a mug. What's going to happen? We, we love conference committee time because everything happens that you didn't expect to have happen during the, the first half of the session. All the assumptions that you made during the first half of the session How go about out the window. the first nine-tenths of the session? Forget you know, the first half. We've, we've already seen the, the PFAS bill come back. Uh, the language got inserted into another bill. So These are the forever chemicals, which we're, we're going to be right, exempted had died, right. but only to apparently really be forever chemicals. So basically the, the, the last bastion here is the governor. You know, when, when a bill gets to him, will he sign it or veto it? And this is going to be very interesting this year in particular because it's his, his last opportunity to leave a mark on the, these pieces of legislation and to make a statement about things. His, and he can do it without being bound because he doesn't have to worry about being accountable to the, the voters or to get through any programs in the General Assembly next year. He won't be here. He doesn't have to witness uh, an override, which has been the record in many of his well, he, uh, vetoes to date. Yeah, he, he would. He could. And this could happen in, in May if, if he does decide to veto something. And I think if he does decide to veto something, I think that the, the one bill right now that we're looking at would be the, the that's reached him already would, would be the, uh, the bill restricting the public access counselor from making decisions based on certain kinds of, of circumstances. I think perhaps you know, Spencer Deary's bill is another one, as, as Representative Delaney made real clear, is, is one that, that will get a, a very close look in the governor's There's a lot office. of pressure, as I mentioned. Clergy groups, civil rights and, groups have uh, been petitioning the governor. And what's interesting here is that the, the universities, the major research universities, are not on the same page on this one. And usually on policy issues like this, you see them in lockstep. And we certainly saw that in terms of their opposition uh, and how forceful and how visible. Ed, as always, appreciate your insight. Thank you, John. Well, that concludes another edition of Indiana Lawmakers. I'm John Schwannis, and on behalf of commentator Ed Feigenbaum, WFYI Public Media, and Indiana's other public broadcasting stations, I thank you for joining us, and I invite you to visit WFYI.org for more Statehouse news. Until next week, take care.